pretty awesome. Um, so Sarah Locko works with the Susan B. Anthony Birthplace, and she's a political and political science and Spanish double major at Elizabethtown College. And she said that working at the Susan B. Anthony Birthplace Museum has allowed her to learn more about the fascinating history behind Miss Anthony's connections to pro-life work and the importance of celebrating motherhood. We also have Miss Kristen Hawking. She is our president at Students for Life of America. She helped get Students for Life going since 2006 and has been touring speaking on feminism this last fall. And then we have Abby Johnson. <laughs> Abby was a former Planned Parenthood worker and after coming into the pro-life movement said we need to make something happen for these workers and these women and these families that are being affected. So I'm not going to waste any time on introductions because we have a full room and everybody wants to hear these ladies speak. So, Kristen Hawkins. Thanks, Camille. Um, can I use this to like put my water? Or okay. We're having throat want. issues. Perfect. Apparently I'm a loud mouth and I talk too much. I did a lot of bullhorning. I got the bullhorn yesterday because I thought I could do it. Um, so I want to thank you all for coming in to our feminism and abortion workshop. Um, I want to kind of introduce this theme uh, and kind of set the stage for what we're going to be talking about. Sarah's going to speak uh, first, uh, then Abby, and then after they're finished, we're going to come back and do some Q&A, which I think will be exciting. Um, so this uh, fall, uh, I embarked on my first kind of college speaking tour called the Lies Feminist Tell Tour. Um, it was actually a speech that I gave uh, last year at Whitworth University uh, about the history of feminism and abortion, and um, what happens to women during abortion, how abortion harms women. Um, and so we gave it a new name because feminism was a buzzword this year, uh, and it was a little controversial. Uh, some people were like, you should have said some, and maybe we should have said some feminists. Uh, when we were talking about feminists, we were talking about mainstream feminists. Um, and I went through five, after I went through the history of the feminist movement, talking about Susan B. Anthony, talking about Elizabeth Cady Stanton, how you know they were those first wave feminists, those suffragettes who were pro-life, talking about Alice Paul, author of ERA. Uh, I really talked a lot about kind of that first wave of feminism, and I also talked about that second wave of feminism. Uh, we've had in the past Sue Ellen Browder. Have you ever heard of Sue Ellen Browder? She wrote this amazing book called Subverted. Sue Ellen was a writer at Cosmopolitan in the late 60s. Uh, she's post-abortive. Uh, she kind of was in that New York City culture uh, when the second wave of feminism was rising up. And she talks about in her book at great length what happened, how abortion uh, kind of was set into the feminist movement. And how it was two men, Bernard Nathanson and Larry Ladder. Bernard Nathanson was an abortionist in New York State who later became pro-life and, and produced like kind of the first pro-life film uh, about abortion it's called The Silent Scream. Have any of you all seen it? You can see it on YouTube now. You can go to YouTube and type in The Silent Scream. It's an ultrasound uh, that they recorded of a live abortion happening. And Dr. Nathanson uh, goes through uh, very matter-of-factly what's happening to the child during the process. And it was, uh, in terms of pro-life movement history, it was transformational. It brought a whole new generation of people into that movement after they saw that window to the womb, uh, the violence that was being inflicted upon that child in the womb. So Bernard Nathanson and Larry Ladder, who was a biographer of Margaret Sanger. You all know who Margaret Sanger is, right? Margaret Sanger was the founder of Planned Parenthood, uh, the Birth Control League. Uh, she was a known eugenicist. She believed in negative eugenics and positive eugenics and was a proponent of that. She believed that some people uh, should have the right to reproduce and others shouldn't, uh, and that we should be involved in making those decisions. Uh, and so Larry Ladder, uh, he r had met with Margaret Sanger multiple times, and actually they had a falling out towards the end of her life because he believed in abortion, and Margaret Sanger, to the moment of death, did it. It's pretty interesting stuff. Um, but he was a believer in the, uh, what he thought was the impending demographic bomb, population bomb of the 1970s, that the world was going to be overpopulated with myth that you guys hear on campuses a lot, which is not true. And so he actually came to believe that abortion uh, was fundamental to fixing that. 
that problem. So those two men founded NARAL, National Association of Appeal of Abortion Laws, and they understood that they needed to move this eugenics movement that was got popular in the late 1880s, but it was mainly popular with upper white, rich, middle class men uh, in elite circles. And they needed to move it to a popular movement. They needed to attack uh, a target. Uh, and so that's how uh, they approached Betty Friedan about abortion, about birth control. Uh, and that's when the attacks on the Catholic Church and things like that, attacking that institution happened. So I talked all about this in my speech. Uh, and then I started talking about the lies in modern feminism that, as, that I see. Uh, that many of us have experienced or kind of have fallen victim to in our lives. Uh, the first one I talked about was the lie uh, that sex is without consequence. Uh, we all know that sex has consequences. Um, one big one is disease. One in two of us under 25, according to the CDC, will obtain at least one STD in our lifetime. That's kind of a big deal. Despite having condoms everywhere for free, we are in the midst of what the CDC calls an epidemic crisis. I, I talked a lot about that. Uh, I, I talk about the second lie of mainstream feminism, uh, which is uh, that birth control is good for your body. And this one is controversial, but we all know, uh, and Abby is an NFP practitioner, so she knows way more than I do about this, uh, putting carcin potentially carcinogenic drugs, uh, artificial hormones into your body, uh, isn't really good. And we can talk about this all day long, it's probably another session. Um, but you know, when the World Health Organization labels you know, birth control a potential group, uh, group one carcinogen, uh, that is cause for concern. And when we, you know, I only drink organic milk uh, and eat organic meat, but then you're talking about putting artificial hormones into your body. There's a, there's a big discussion needs to be having. There's a great, there's actually a growing secular movement right now uh, about this. Um, I've been listening to a lot of podcasts, like Canadian podcasts by, um, it's fascinating, where these women aren't Catholic, they're not religious, um, they're not pro-life, they're not against abortion, they're not conservative, but they realize this is not holistic. This is not what our bodies were designed to do. We're actually poisoning our bodies. Why are we, if we're proud to women, if we're proud of our bodies, why are we doing this to our bodies? Uh, there's a documentary Ricky Lake is producing called Sweetening the Pill. Uh, I, would, I would totally recommend you all like, liking their Facebook page because every time there's a new study that comes out, uh, they're posting. There was a big uh, Danish study that came out linking uh, birth control uh, to um, suicide, and it was a <coughs> tragic study, and you all should check that out. What, what is the page? Uh, it's called Sweetening the Pill. It's, a, it's the name of the documentary that hasn't been named. They're still fundraising for it. So the third and fourth lie of feminism I talk, I talk about in the speech is that abortion is easy. And abortion is safe. And I go through in this presentation the women who have died from legal abortions in the past few years, legal abortions, at Planned Parenthood that no one ever wants to talk about. I talk about Kermit Gosnell and his house of horrors. I talk about the physical and emotional com com complications that women all across the world are suffering because of abortion. I talk about the abortion breast cancer link, the, the definitive study that came out um, from China of the 34 provinces that showed a direct um, relationship there. I also talk about how abortion really, you know, when they, when they sell you abortion, and one of our team members, Allie, will speak about this, um, she wrote a wonderful blog about she's post-abortive, and she talks about when she went into that abortion facility at a Planned Parenthood to have that abortion, what she was told. It'll be over, you'll feel relief, and how she never never felt that, uh, and, and how, she, how she felt guilt. But no one ever talks about that guilt. Um, the fact that you know the modern feminist movement tells us that we have to kill another human being, pay somebody to commit an act of violence upon another person in order that we can live the lives we want. There's something fundamentally wrong with that. And I think you all know that. I'm not like, I'm not at Dartmouth or Harvard right now, so I'm not expecting any protesters, although I think there are some people from the other side here today. Um, we welcome you. Welcome. <laughs> welcome. We're placing seeds in your mind, even if you disagree with us. Uh, the truth <laughs> tends to kind of grow. Um, and then the fifth lie of mainstream feminism I talk about is really more of a more personal one, um, and that is uh, the myth that you can't have it all. So we're told, like, when we were told in college and high school, like, you have to have the abortion, you can't do it. Really, because we're the ones, the pro-lifers, right? We're the ones who say, yes, you can do it. You are strong enough. You can do it. We will walk with you through this. It will be hard, but you can do it. You can have your child. You don't have to choose between the life of your child and the life you've always dreamed for yourself. We're the ones who say that. But then what also happens is 
when you're older and you're, you know, in your career and then you want to have a child, it's, oh, it's easy. You can have your career, you can have your marriage, and you can do everything you want to do and also have all those babies. And eh, wrong. <laughs> and I talk a lot in my presentation about my personal life, of, of how you're always juggling. As a, you know, I work, you know, 60 hours a week. I travel all over the country. I'm um, the primary breadwinner for my family. My husband actually doesn't work anymore. He stays at home and homeschools our children since I'm traveling. And two of my children have uh, cystic fibrosis, which takes a lot of time. Uh, it was best that one of us was home. Um, but I can't have it all. When I'm here, I'm not there. I got sent a video just a couple of minutes ago of my kids going through the car wash that were freaking out. It was amazing. <laughs> I missed that. I missed that moment with them, especially with my Gunner and my Gracie, whose lives will be shortened uh, because of the disease they have. Um, every time I'm away, every time I'm serving this movement and I'm not home with them, I'm sacrificing a very precious day a very precious hour. Um, and we can't have it all. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, I think I'm a big proponent, like when we're in high school and college, you should take us aside and be like, hey, here's how not to get in debt. Don't buy a new car out of college. <laughs> uh, here, you know, here's how to balance a checkbook, checkbook. But there also should be a discussion of here's how you can try to balance it. Here's how you try to make it work. Because it's hard and it's never gonna be perfect. And I talk a lot about glass balls and rubber balls. Like, I always gotta figure out what my balls are. <laughs> so thank you, Abby. She's the only one again. Everyone's like, hey. you have to figure out your balls are. There's glass balls and there's rubber balls, right? And as a mom, I have glass balls. I have my health, my children's health, my marriage. I have other. I have rubber balls though. I have things that you know, you know, my mortgage payments. It's a pretty big deal, but it's not the end of the world. My car payments. I have things that work that are rubber balls, things that work that are glass balls, that I'm always juggling. And you have to figure out what are the balls that you can drop and bounce back up, and what are the balls if you drop, they'll shatter. And you just constantly have this reevaluation of my priorities, and I kind of stink at it most of the time. Like, I'm constantly like, uh-oh, too much time at work, not enough time at home. Oh, I gotta get on the road, we don't have any money in the checking account for work, we need to pay payroll next week. You know, I'm constantly reevaluating, and, and I talk a lot on my campus tour about these struggles. So I wanted to set that up of, you know, when we talk about feminism and, and, and do pro-lifers, um, are we feminists, should we be feminists, should we call ourselves uh, feminists, things to think about um, for our discussion today, and I hope we get to get some good questions and answers. But before we kind of go into more of this broader discussion, I want to bring up Sarah. Uh, Sarah is an intern, right? I just see the Nancy birthplace. Actually, it's in the middle of nowhere. It's in the Berkshires, Massachusetts. It's gorgeous. I actually had the chance to go there because when I was going from Princeton to Dartmouth, and I was like, oh, it's only an hour out of the way in the middle of nowhere. Let's do it. It was great. I was a little hungry because there wasn't any fast food right around. But you all should go and intern there, by the way. Uh, they have an amazing internship program, and you actually get college credit, and there's like tons of hiking. So if you're an outdoorsy person, you can go there, and you can do like any type of internship. But it's awesome. I took my son. It was so cool to be in the house where Susan B. Anthony was born and was raised uh, for a part of her life. So Sarah, do you want to come talk a little about history and where feminism has come? So thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak today. So my name is Sarah, and I am a college student. I'm 20 years old, but I also work for the Susan B. Anthony Birthplace Museum. And we are a small house museum located pretty much, as Kristen said, in the middle of nowhere in it's Adams, beautiful Massachusetts. It's beautiful. Yes, Adams. it's beautiful. <laughs> and the Susan B. Anthony Birthplace Museum primarily focuses on the early childhood home of Miss Anthony, and we also talk about her early feminist activities. So we have a variety, excuse me, a variety of exhibits such as the birthing room, which is where she was born, and I actually, as the intern, slept in the floor above the birthing room, so that was a pretty interesting experience. I got to sleep in the museum overnight. And I also had the opportunity to be a tour guide, so I went through the different <coughs> suffrage exhibits. We had one on abolition, we had one on temperance, and we also had one on our opposition to restalism wall. And this is probably the most important part of the museum, Explain because it really, yes, yeah, so restalism, is, and I actually have a few slides on that, but restalism is basically an old term for abo abortion. And it's kind of a strange name, but it was coined after uh, the name of a New York City abortionist named Madame Restel. It's not her real name. Her real name is Anne Trow Lohman, but she was a New York City abortionist with no medical training, and she and her husband 
after becoming pseudo pharmacists essentially decided that they wanted to perform these procedures as a way to make profit and so she was infamous she definitely hurt a lot of women and of course their children and so we get the name Restalism after this woman, uh, Madame Spell's name. And so one of the interesting things about the Susan B. Anthony birthplace is we are the owners of the largest collection of the Revolution, which is a radical feminist newspaper that Susan B. Anthony herself was the owner and publisher of from 1868 to 1870. And it's interesting because when you look at the Revolution, mm -hmm. we have a variety of justice issues. We talk about hazing, we talk about pay equity, we talk about anti-poverty reform, prison reform, and we also have a section on anti-abortion efforts. When you look at the topic frequency in the revolution, you'll see something kind of interesting. We see here, we have anti-imperialism is mentioned 23 times in the articles of the revolution. We have dress reform, which is 100, which is definitely a lot. We also have instances of racial injustice that was mentioned 26 times, but abortion <coughs> is mentioned 133 times. So there's definitely no disputing the fact that it was a key issue even in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And so I'm going to fast forward through these slides just for the sake of time. But a variety of causes and feminist groups were represented in the revolution. We had words from the African American journalist Ida B. Wells. We talked about anti-war. We also have a section in the revolution from Jeanette Rankin who was the first woman elected uh, to federal office in the United States. But the biggest question most visitors have when they visit the Susan B. Anthony birthplace is why did the revolution refuse abortion ads? And it really comes down to a very basic answer. It's because they believed abortion was immoral. This isn't something that we're pulling from the top of our head. This was stated in 21 subsequent sections of the newspaper. So I've just covered what is restalism. <laughs> and another interesting thing to note is it wasn't just female feminists that were talking about uh, the revolution and were mentioning restalism in this section. We also had Parker Pillsbury, who is a famous male feminist, and he said the frightful increase of feticide, infanticide, and child murder in every form has forced the subject of foundling hospitals they seem to be necessities inevitable as life preservers to float society, even in the sea of barbarism. And so this definitely was not limited to just female feminists. We also have sections from Elizabeth Blackwell, who was a British-born British physician, and she was the first woman to receive a medical degree in the United States, and she was definitely against and opposed to abortion, as this quote states. We also have Dr. Charlotte Denman Lozier, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was one of Susan B. Anthony's very good friends. In fact, in the Susan B. Anthony Birthplace Museum, we do have the Stanton quilt, which is especially significant. I don't know if you can see it here, but you can see Elizabeth Cady Stanton is raising a blue flag to commemorate the birth of her youngest son. And so motherhood is definitely not something to be feared by these pro-life feminists. It's something to be celebrated. And she once said, when we consider that women are treated as property, it is degrading to women that we should treat our children as property to be disposed of as we see fit. We also had doctors and feminists such as Dr. Anna Densmore of French speak about the topic of abortion in editorials for the revolution. And of course, Susan B. Anthony, in addition to being the editor and the publisher, of the revolution also spoke about abortion quite a bit in her own personal writings. In this diary entry, she talks about her, how her sister Annie underwent an abortion and kind of her experiences with caring for her sister after that event. And during her speech on social purity in Chicago in uh, 1875, she also spoke about infanticide and abortion. So there are currently four waves of feminism. The first wave did begin with the pro-life feminists. So it's important to note that the suffrage movement was in essence a pro-life movement from the very beginning. And so of course we have Susan B. Anthony leading the way. We also have Alice Hall. And then in the 1960s we have the second wave of feminism. And of course this is a very broad overview. We could talk about this for days. but. Betty Friedan was one of the most influential figures of the second wave feminist movement. She was the uh, publisher, excuse me, she was the writer of The Feminine Mystique, 
and she was also the co-founder of the National Organization for Women, which is an organization that, since its founding, essentially decided to drive women away from those traditional gender roles. So the second wave feminists decided that they needed to condemn the masculine values, or at least what they believed were the masculine values in society. So we have things such as war and violence, exploitation of the earth. We also have things such as individualistic autonomy and the hierarchy or the patriarchy, which of course is a word we hear oftentimes in modern society today. And they proposed a new set of feminist values to go in opposition against these masculine values. So instead of war and violence, we have non-violence. Instead of exploitation of the earth, we have ecological harmony. Instead of autonomy, we have community. And instead of the patriarchy, we have equality. Of course, these terms on the right seem very positive <coughs> from the outset. But with the introduction of abortion rights, or so-called abortion rights, we soon discovered that the second wave feminists and their values were directly in opposition to pro-life standards. So instead of nonviolence, we have human destruction. Instead of ecological harmony, we have self-mutilation. Instead of community, we have a procedure that negates familial and social relationships. And instead of equality or cooperation, we have a procedure that really is about power and about domination over the unborn child and their mothers. And of course, with this wave of feminism, we also have figures and politicians such as Diane Feinstein, who is a politician who, among many other actions, uh, for example, she voted no on restricting the UN funding for population control measures. And in 2007, she also voted yes when it came to supporting embryonic stem cell research. So we can see just an interesting timeline from the pro-life feminist movement to now we're seeing in the later feminist movements more of a pro-abortion hijacking of the original values that feminists stood for. And of course, with the third wave, which began in the early 1990s, we have figures such as Rebecca Walker, who really championed intersectional feminism and focused on gender and race. So although this may seem like a very bleak future for current pro-life feminists, if you call yourself that, there is a fourth wave of feminism that began in 2012. And this wave is a bit disputed over because some people who are pro-life uh, want to call themselves feminists and then others decide, you know what, I need to separate the two. I cannot be pro-life. I cannot be pro-life and a feminist. And so that's been the controversy there in modern times. Another interesting thing about the fourth wave of feminism is it focuses mainly on social media. So you're seeing Instagram, you're seeing Twitter, you're seeing Facebook, you're seeing Snapchat, and these are how fourth wave feminists are often getting their message across. And so another interesting thing about fourth wave feminism is it mainly is supposed to focus on anti-sexual harassment as we've unfortunately seen quite a bit in the news. And we've also seen instances of nonviolent efforts and movements, which seem to be in line with the pro-life movement. And just to end, we do have several consistent life ethic groups currently practicing in the United States. Of course, we have Feminists for Life of America, we have Democrats for Life, we have Respect Life of Great Britain, and we do have the Susan B. Anthony uh, Birthplace Museum. And so I'm not going to tell you, do you need to be pro-life and a feminist? I'm sure we'll talk about that in the Q&A. But I think the thing we have to pay attention to is we have to be pro-life before everything else. You know, when we see modern day feminists talk about women's rights, about pay equity, about nonviolence, about domestic violence, <coughs> harassment, we really need to ask ourselves, well, the right to life is the most important right because without that right, all other rights cannot follow. So I'm, I'm supposed to talk to you about, um, which is, I guess, timely since the second Women's March happened today. So I'm supposed to talk to you about um, sort of the feminist movement today, now, um, what's happening in it, uh, what we see um, happening at women's marches, at the women's convention. Um, I attended both last year. I, I didn't go this year because I was like, I've, I've been traumatized, traumatized twice in one year, so I'm good. Um, so 
Um, a few things that you should know, though, just about the current feminist movement is that it is, um, it is a pro-abortion movement. So be clear. Um, you cannot, as a pro-life activist, find yourself in the current feminist movement and feel comfortable there. If you feel comfortable in the current modern day feminist movement, then you're doing your pro-life wrong. Okay? Um, they're, they're undergirding, the undergirding of everything they do is about reproductive rights. The uh, Women's March Every, I would say probably 90% of the signs that I saw had something to do with abortion. It, it, feminism of today is not about immigrant, immigrant rights. It's not about unions. It's not about, um, I don't know, equal pay. It's not about any of those things. The feminist movement of today is about abortion. And we can see that by who the primary sponsors are of things like the Women's March and the Women's Convention. The premier sponsors for both of those activities is Planned Parenthood, NARAL, National Organization for Women. Abortion, abortion, abortion. Okay? So, I think that it, we have a tendency right now, because feminism is sort of a buzzword, it's cool. If you want to call yourself a feminist, awesome, okay? But don't let that mix in with your pro-life activities and weaken your pro-life argument. Because that absolutely can happen. I've seen pro-lifers sort of, um, unfortunately, sort of get mixed up in the current feminist movement, and they become real sympathizers for the modern day feminist movement. And that's a tragedy. Because what they're doing is they're weakening their stance on abortion. And like I said this morning, everything that we do in the pro-life movement, you can follow a consistent life ethic. And I hope you look into it. That's awesome. But everything that you do in the pro-life movement should be about ending abortion. 100%. So, when I went to the women's uh, convention last year um, in Detroit, there are a few things I sort of noticed about the women's convention. Um, when I worked at Planned Parenthood eight years ago, um, our motto was we want to keep abortion safe, legal, and rare. That was sort of the tagline. That's what Obama said, safe, legal, and rare. Safe, legal, and rare. That's what we heard all the time over and over again. Okay? Um, now, it's not about being safe, legal, and rare. Because then, cause then the, the, the thing was, well, if it's safe and if it's legal, then why make it rare? <laughs> right? Like, if it's a good thing, why do you want it to be rare? So then I think they figured out, like, oh, that was sort of dumb. And then, um, so then it became about access. So we even saw that in California. So there was a pilot study done in California, this is several years ago, um, where it was before, I can't remember the bill number, but it was before um, nurse practitioners, so mid-level nurses were able to perform abortions in California. They had done a pilot study about this, and Planned Parenthood was the one that was backing the study and the research. And they had, they had, um, they had had these, uh, these mid-level nurses performing abortions and they were looking at the results. And what they found was that uh, women who had had abortions by, by mid-level clinicians, by mid-level nurses, had a higher rate of uterine perforation, higher rate of retained products of tissue, higher rate of um, infection, a higher rate of hysterectomy, okay? And so the woman from Planned Parenthood gets up, on the, gets up to testify on this bill and someone, uh, whoever was from the pro-life movement, says, hey, but look at this study. Like, you're sort of touting this study, but look at all the harm it did to women. And she said, yes, but that may be true, but it made abortion more accessible. And that's what we're about. So sort of like, 
We want abortion to be accessible, damn the consequences to women. And that's really what the pro-life movement is. I mean, the pro-choice... <laughs> I'm really trumping it up today. Um, that's really what the pro-choice movement is about. And um, it's really what the modern day feminist movement is about as well. Um, they are more brazen with abortion than ever before. I went to a, a workshop where it was women telling their stories. It was, it was teaching women, encouraging women to tell their stories about their abortions. And so uh, these women on the panel were sitting up there and they were very proud of themselves for having abortions. One woman was proud of herself for having six abortions. Um, wanted other people to have abortions, said having an abortion is really a rite of passage for women, um, and said that, you know, she believes that abortion clinics should start having party buses so that women, after they have their abortions, can jump on a party bus and everybody celebrate the fact that she just made this monumental, beautiful decision in her life. Okay, so they've become much more brazen. When I worked at Planned Parenthood, it was sort of like, we had abortion brochures, but we kept them like behind the counter. We didn't sort of have them out right in front because we didn't want everybody to know that, you know that we did that. Now they're very out and out with their support of abortion. Um, and because that's who they are and they're getting applauded for it by the modern day feminist movement, they're getting uh, Planned Parenthood continues to have their funding increase year after year. Um, because people are supporting abortion. I mean, it's not about pap smears. That's, pap smears aren't controversial, right? Pap smears don't bring in income, but abortion does. Whatever is controversial, that's what tends to bring in income for them. Um, another thing that's sort of talking about like being more brazen is that you know, these, um, these, these women, the modern day feminist movement, um, is really, really focused on their genitals. They talk about them a lot. We talked about balls earlier. I mean, we did talk about Kristen's balls, so. Um, but they're really hung up on it. Um, they wear hats about it. They're really, they can't stop talking about it. And that really is a failure of feminism that women have been whittled down to simply their parts. Um, modern day feminism has failed women in many ways because we are not just parts. We are complete women. Um, let's see, the other thing I noticed um, was, well, I'm trying to find this, um, that, Secular feminists, the modern day feminists, are terrified of those of us who do identify as pro-life feminists. Um, they do not believe that those two things go together. They do not believe that you can be pro-life and then claim to be a feminist. Um, that's not true. Of course you can be a pro-life feminist. Um, I think one of the things that the modern day feminist movement is missing is that they have forgotten that really the most powerful tool in feminism is valuing femininity. And being a woman in itself is powerful because we have these amazing superpowers, right? Uh, women are able to gestate, ovulate, and lactate. That's really, that's really cool. That is awesome. Like. I got, this, I got the eggs to have a baby, then I can grow the baby, then my body instinctually knows how to push out a baby, and then I can feed that baby with my body. Like, there's nothing more empowering than embracing your body for what it is and, um, and celebrating that. Um, but it was funny. I gotta find this quote. Um, these people... We're talking about their parts. <laughs> but, um, oh, there's, a, there's at least a kid in the room. I actually can't say this quote. Use a code word. A code word? <laughs> yeah, it's a code word. Okay. 
Okay, one of the okay, one of the titles of the um, workshop that I went to was called "Not All Booties Are Pink and Not All Women Have Booties." Not all cats are pink, and not all women have cats. I meant booties like your feet, not booties like booty. Cats make more sense, thank you. Um, isn't that a weird, like, title, though, to a thing? Like, isn't that weird? Like, they're defining who is a woman and who isn't. And that's sort of, that is the, the construct of the current modern feminist movement, right? <laughs> is that femininity and feminism don't go hand in hand. That femininity and womanhood don't go hand in hand. And that's a lie. Femin femininity, 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 and femininity. Ugh, I need a nap. And um, <laughs> femininity and women, womanhood absolutely goes together. Okay, and and. You know, I just, I don't know, I think there's a lot of confusion right now in the pro-life movement, this whole feminism debacle. Um, thanks, um, Kristen. Um, look, I don't really think it matters what you call yourself at the end of the day. You can be a feminist. You can be an anti-feminist. You can be a Christian, you can be an anti-theist, you can be gay, you can be straight. I, I don't care what label you put on yourself. But at the end of the day, if your goal is to make abortion unthinkable, then I'm with you. And that... I think we get caught, I think we get a little too worried about what label we put on ourselves. Like, well, I'm a pro life feminist. Well, I'm not, and you're wrong. Well, I am, and you're wrong. Well, I'm, I don't give two turds <laughs> what you call yourself, if you're a feminist or not. But you do need to understand that it is normal for the mainstream media to look at someone who calls themselves a pro life feminist and say, that doesn't make sense. And why doesn't that make sense? Because feminism, in every modern day sense of the word, is anti-life. They're about pitting women against their children. They're about suppressing your fertility as a woman. You apparently don't even have to be a woman to be a woman. The modern day feminist movement is one of the most confused movements in our culture today. And I'm gonna be perfectly honest with you. I at one time believed that maybe I could find some common ground with modern day feminists. And there might be some things that we can agree on. But anybody who believes that the fundamental right to life shouldn't or doesn't exist. Anybody that believes that a child in the womb is not as valuable as a child that is born is not someone that I have a desire to work with. When we try to make excuses for who we are as pro-lifers, and we try to rationalize what their beliefs are, we begin to lose our passion and lose who we are. 
Don't lose your message in order to fit in with another group of people. Who gives a crap if you fit in with the women's march? Who cares if you fit in with modern day feminism? I don't want to fit in with modern day feminism. I can't. Because they are opposed to the basic fundamental right to life. And that is never a group that I can be in support of. So um, that's a great question. So um, Christina's question, if you didn't hear, is sort of like, how can we bridge a gap and take people that are sort of really enslaved in modern feminism, um, how do we bring them out? How do we bring them to our side? And um, you know, I think that's a great question. I'm not sure it has a really easy answer. It hasn't been easy to get workers out of the abortion industry. But what we do find is that there will sometimes be um, a moment in their life where they begin to question what they believe. And, um, and you know, what I found at the Women's March, too, the first year I went, was there were people, I was holding like a pro-life feminist sign, and I had these people, all these women coming up to me, and they're whispering to me, saying, I agree with you, I'm pro-life, too. But they didn't, and I was like, well, come walk with me. And they were like, Oh, no, no, no. And so I think part of it is empowering them and helping them understand that, um, that believing in the sanctity of human life is something that they don't have to be ashamed of. But a lot of times it takes a specific moment in their life for them to say, I'm ready to speak out. I'm ready to do something. And so I think um, you know, that's one of the beauties of the pro-life movement is having multiple groups where people can get plugged into and can get information Whereas we don't have one singular strategy for making abortion illegal or um, in, unthinkable. We have multiple strategies for going about that, right? So, um, and I think the more diverse our pro-life movement is, the better. So I think not making it a just a Christian movement is important. I think um, doing everything we can to separate ourselves from the Republican Party as you know, we're not a Republican movement, right? Um, but we are a movement of diversity, and um, we have black pro-lifers, and we have a lot of white pro-lifers, and um, you know, and we have uh, Muslim pro-lifers, and um, we have gay pro-lifers, and we have bisexual pro-lifers, and. You know, we have pro-lifers all around the country and in internationally, and there's some, we have consistent pro-lifers, you know, that work 
for the abolition of the death penalty and all these things. I feel like there's a lot of ways that people who are sort of struggling or questioning can get involved in. That's what I think is so beautiful about the pro-life movement is that we are a group of diverse individuals and, and that's a strength for us to be able to pull in multiple people. One more question. We have time for one more question. Ooh, who's the lucky winner? No. Make it a good one. <laughs> Did you get really excited and like, yeah, yeah I, I, have I, have I, have I have a question. Okay, question. okay. all right, go. Shoot. All right. How do you think we can reclaim uh, feminism for a pro-life movement when our femininity is being um, like under attack? Like, as a woman, what is it to be a woman if I don't have the right or I, I have to choose to abort the baby inside of me and I have to suppress my own um, uh, hormones? Like, what? How, how do I become a feminist if uh, my femininity is under attack. Okay. I'm not, I wouldn't be worried about reclaiming feminism. Honestly, like, I, I've been thinking about this a lot lately. And when I was in high school and college, I would call myself a pro-life feminist, and I found, like, like duh, like, pro-lifers, we care about women. I mean, we're feminists and menace too, I don't know what you call us. <laughs> like we're four men and women, right? We want both of them to be born. Um, and, but I found that when you said that though, people kind of look a different, different way. They'd be like, oh, you're not crazy, I'll have a conversation with you. And I'd say, yeah, like, duh, I'm going, you know, I'm here on scholarship, I want to work in politics, you know, I want to have this career. Um, I'm not saying that women should be barefoot pregnant in the kitchen. Like, and I think, because that's, I think what the problem is, and the reason why we, try to reclaim these terms is because ultimately what we're saying is that we think there's something wrong with the brand pro-life. Because if pro-life was the cool brand, if pro-life was a brand we were proud of, we wouldn't have to say, yeah, I'm pro-life, but I'm also a, um, I'm pro-life, but I'm a feminist. I'm pro-life, but I'm gay, or whatever. Because it should be cool to say I'm pro-life because we are in the majority. We should be proud to say, I'm pro-life. And so I think, and so, you know, I, I, a few years ago, I stopped kind of identifying myself as a pro-life feminist. And it wasn't, it was before the Women's March and seeing all the craziness and stuff like that. Because what I realized was, what we need to do is we need to reclaim and, and rebrand what pro-life is. Because we spend so much time in our movement, um, we talk a lot about messaging and, and you know, this, these decisions about, well, maybe we should take a stance on 15 different issues. That way we can show people we love them more. Um, no, that's a conversation. That's a conversation that we have um, when we, we're talking with someone. Well, what we need to do is work on that brand. Because as a movement, we've never really said, like Planned Parenthood puts tens of millions of dollars every year into Planned Parenthood's brand. They take out nice billboards all across the country, and it's, you know, a nice looking doctor, and she's got a white coat on, and it's like, Planned Parenthood served this many women. Planned Parenthood helped this many children. And you're like, uh, okay. Um, they, they, but they, they're working on their brand. So when we attack them, people are like, what do you mean? Planned Parenthood does good things. And you're like, oh. Well, we as a movement don't do that. Because the great thing about movement is so, we're so diverse. There's so many of us. It's like whack-a-mole, you know? You can't really pin us yeah. down. You're like, pick one group, and it's like, Damn it, another, another one popped, popped up. up. And we're everywhere. That's, we're like real warfare. We're the insurgents. We're the Davids. And that's what we need to stay. Um, but we need to come together and work together on our brand. So we can all say we're pro-life and this is what pro-life is. Pro-life means we serve this many hundreds of thousands of women this year in pregnancy care centers across the country. We save this many tens of thousands of babies from abortion, from the abortion. You know, we can say this is who we are. And I think, honestly, that's the brand that I'm more, like, I'm not, I don't have time in the day to worry about the feminist brand, because they've got major problems. <laughs> they have major problems. I mean, the argument to this weekend was they were telling people not to wear the pussy hat, the pink pussy hat, because they had, sorry, oh, sorry. Uh, pussy hat. <laughs> pussy cat hat. Um, because so many people were upset because not all women have cats. Um, and so they thought that was discriminatory. And so they have like, they fight amongst themselves. 
And, and the polling that came out this week, and I don't know if you saw it, you guys are probably all traveling here. The polling that came out from Morris this week showed that only 13% of American women agree with the Democratic National Committee's platform of abortion whenever, wherever, and 100% taxpayer funded. And that same platform, the exact same platform that the Women's March adapted la adopted last year, when all of us pro-life women were like, we're gonna be there, we're women. We represent the majority of women. So they're the ones who are out of touch. They have a major brand problem. So the good news is I think our brand's better than their brand. Because 17% of American women, 20% of American women say they're better. So we're winning. So I think that's the term I wanna spend my time and my precious, you know, my most precious asset is my time. I want to spend my time fixing that brand. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I, I think, um, look, I think calling yourself a pro-life feminist is basically media headline worthy. Um, but I, I don't know that, it, that would be like, I equate it to this. Feminism is so tanked right now. Modern day feminism is so tanked. It's so messed up. That that would be like me starting an organization to say, um, I'm, I'm going to work to make Planned Parenthood not support abortion anymore. Like, who's going to donate to that? Like, anybody? You want to be my intern or something? Like, that's what we're going to do. We're going to work to make Planned Parenthood, uh, we're going to work to make abortion unthinkable at Planned Parenthood. Sound good? No, that's like the dumbest idea ever. I would never be able to do that because they are, Planned Parenthood is entrenched in abortion. Everything they do is surrounded by abortion. And that's currently what our modern day feminist movement is about. It is surrounded by abortion. It is entrenched in abortion. Everything that they believe comes back to abortion. That's their primary issue here. So while I think it's beautiful to call yourself a pro-life feminist, because I believe that real feminists should be pro-life, okay? Like, of course. I believe that wholeheartedly. I'm with Kristen. I'm too busy to get caught up in the labels of who's a feminist and who's not. Y'all, we've got work to do. We don't have time to, like, bicker. Oh, we're like, I'm a feminist, and I'm not, and I am, but I'm a woman, I'm a man, I'm a feminist. Like, I don't care, okay? Like, let's get focused. Let's get serious. One of the reasons that the pro-life movement has been sort of, like, flailing about and not actually being, like, like, being totally, like, focused and zeroed in and targeted is because we are so freaking worried about what everybody else is doing and what everybody else is calling themselves and what everybody else's strategy is. You know what? Figure out your strategy and stay laser focused on that target. And I'm going to figure out my strategy and I'm going to stay laser focused on that target. And Ruben's going to figure out what his strategy is and he's going to stay laser focused on that target. He's like, why did you just call me out? And like, that's what we're going to do. We're gonna do what we do the very best. I'm not gonna start an ATWN student group because that's not in my lane, right? But if I wanna get involved with students, I'm gonna call Kristen. I'm gonna say, hey, I need to do some stuff, I need some students. Like, by the way, I need an intern for ATWN, like, on the real. So if anybody wants to be my intern, like, talk to me, okay. Um, so, but like, if I need that, like, if I need an intern, for instance, I'm gonna come to the Students for Life conference and pimp my, that out for myself, right? Um, so, like, that, that's the thing, like, everybody, like, stay focused on ending abortion. Stay focused on making abortion unthinkable. And if we do that, if we stop fighting with each other, if we stop the bickering, we, it will happen. We will make it happen. So keep working. I just don't have to add it all together. Questions have fall.